Have you ever met someone and thought their job sounded cool? Or perhaps you're wondering how you can get to a position that doesn't seem to match any of the qualifications you have at the moment. Well, if so, this podcast is for you. We found some people with jobs that you might not necessarily know about or expect people to have, and we're going to ask them about how they got there. Welcome to What Do They Do, a podcast about jobs and how people got them. Welcome to the podcast. Ben here, and I'm just going to introduce you to an interview that Dean did last year with Caitlin Lewis. On the way through the conversation, they'll talk about sales and startups, but Dean started by asking Caitlin what she wanted to do when she was growing up. Enjoy. I wanted to be a lot of things. I think when I was really young, I wanted to be a hairdresser. And my mum used to joke that she knew how much I loved my Barbies based on how short their hair was, because I'd always cut it. Um, but I, I very quickly left that dream <laughs> to someone else to do. And really, I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, the way that people behave and the way that they think and how they engage with one another is still fascinating to me. Um, and I met an old friend from school on Sunday for brunch and he said to me, what happened to being a psychologist? And I sort of thought, I, I was saying, I think it's still in there. Maybe when I'm a bit older, I might go back and retrain. Um, but then there was also just something about business that has always fascinated me too. And um, so that's the current pursuit. It's amazing. And when that psychologist part, when did that come about? Was that when you were younger that you kind of had this feeling that was something you wanted to do? Or did it come when you were studying? Or? Um, I, I think it was really when I was in high school. So getting into my teens, I just, I had started seeing a psychologist um, during my parents' divorce. And I, I wonder if maybe that was it. Maybe... Um, the extent to which that psychologist helped me just made me realize that there was something really fascinating there. I am by nature quite a reflective person too. Um, and I spend a lot of time analyzing and over analyzing everything going on in my world. And so I guess I see psychology just as a, an extension of that. It's really cool. And do, so you think like from going through kind of some sessions yourself, yeah. and I guess it's that <clears throat> thing of seeing how that was able how they were able to help you yes. do you think what's driven you then beyond psychology into business now and we'll come into exactly what you do in a bit but do you think everything you do is also about kind of helping people has that always been an element I think so um when I think back to what has given me the most satisfaction or sense of achievement in my work it's always been when I have um really engaged on a deeper level with people in my team when we have you know achieved our goals in our work and we've done it through building friendships and closer relationships and we've enjoyed our time doing it um, and even when I look back to my current role which is really quite broad the work that I enjoy the most is the work where I am um, engaging different people and helping them to transition in some way or, you know, just uncover new areas about themselves. That's where I walk away thinking, oh, I've, I've done something good today. I've been valuable. That's amazing. And I, I, that thing about the hairdresser, was, <laughs> I'm just thinking yeah. there's a bit of psychology involved yes. in hairdressing, right? You kind of become someone's counselor almost while you're cutting their hair. You do, don't you? I think that hairdressers have to be the most amazing listeners. And there's so many jokes about how women tell their hairdressers everything. So I've never put the two together. But now that you mention it, there is definitely a connection. <laughs> and do you feel like the that has led you into what you're doing now or was it something was there something that happened that led you into your kind of your current role and the roles that you've had prior um so when i studied i had looked at doing psychology but i i, I studied in south africa and um i i gave up studying maths when i was about 15 or so so i missed out on the last three years of doing maths in high school 
And because of that, I would have had to have done a mathematics bridging course at university before I could have gone on and done psychology. Um, I'm an impatient person and my degree was going to be four years. There was no way I was going to do a fifth year on top of that. Hated maths. And in all honesty, that was kind of what stopped me from studying psychology. I don't know if I had gone and studied psychology, if I would have become a psychologist anyway. Um, but as a result of that, I, I did consider other options, um, but still did my degree in social sciences. And so I think that there was still quite a lot of understanding human beings and their nature within that, which I loved. Um, and now I'm doing my MBA and everything I have loved about that has been the theory and research around the way that people behave, management of change, organizational behavior. So. And your so MBA that. is in business management and administration? Yes. And that's clearly the part of the course that's <laughs> really, that really connects with you is totally. the people part of that. Totally. Um, I mean, I've loved learning all the different modules, you know, even from accounting and financial management, which we've established is not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, because it's new knowledge, which I've enjoyed. But the the modules that I have really engaged with have all been the ones around just, again, understanding behavior. And it's interesting you mentioned about maths basically being the thing that was maybe a bit of a speed bump mm. to kind of then stop you from going and pursuing that thing that perhaps you, you felt like that would have been your favorite thing to yes. do. Um, has that been, a, are there other speed bumps that you feel like you've hit a, along the way in, in the journey that you've had so far? I think plenty of speed bumps. Um, I don't think anybody's career or lives, you know, are challenge free. There will always be um, things that you have to come up against, persevere, and ultimately you hope overcome. What I will say is that every single one of those things has been my own mind. You know, it, it, there hasn't really been some external challenge that has been a major factor in my life and the choices I have made. It's always been about my own beliefs and what is limiting me and either stopping me from you know pursuing whatever it is that I want or me overcoming that and proving myself wrong so Ben and I talk a lot about imposter syndrome yes which I would imagine it sounds like you've, you've heard of it right? yes um, and I think it's fair to say that almost everybody feels it at yeah. some point in a career yeah um, and I work a lot with teachers who are doing things that are really difficult in education. They're trying mm. to make change in a system that has been the way it is for a number of years. Mm. And so you can very much feel like you are just one in a million. No one really understands what it is you're trying to do and like everybody else is against you. Mm. And so that can feed into these feelings of, I don't really know what I'm doing and tomorrow yeah. someone's gonna find out yes. that I'm a fraud and I shouldn't be here. Yeah. Do you still get that now or do you feel like that's something that you've overcome over time? All the time, <laughs> just about every day. Um, I do think that it is really common. I think that it is even more hard felt for women um, because they still are having to fight for their space at the table and prove their worth. Um, and they always talk about the double standard where women have to prove so much more. Um, so I think it's particularly difficult, but especially in my current role, um, I sometimes sit there every day going, why have they hired me? <laughs> why, why me? And really questioning if I am bringing any value. Um, but again, I, I do think that, well, um, you have to understand yourself. Um, and you have to know what it is that's triggering that in order to really help yourself through it. But it's it, it, it's not something that I think, well, I think it's something that a lot of people go through. How do you remind yourself that you should be there and that you are bringing value? Um, I think I look back to where I have had success, um, especially if it's a new challenge. I try to look for similar experiences in any of my past roles um, and remind myself that I have done it before um, or that you know I've done something similar and I can learn from that 
Um, and honestly, just reminding myself that I'm not alone. Um, I look around me, I read a lot on sort of, you know, startups, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and those always remind me that just about every single person has felt that way. Um, and do still feel that way. And, and as you say, wondering when everybody's going to realize that you're a massive fraud. So you also mentioned there um, about gender yes. and how particularly in management positions, there's a lack of women yeah. in these positions. Um, ben and I, last time we spoke, actually had, a, had an interesting discussion about a similar thing. Mm. So in the UK, 75% of teachers-ish are mm. female. Mm. Um, and yet when we run events that involve people training, the vast majority of the trainers are male. Yes. And so it's something that we've been really trying to work on bringing more women mm. into the field of, of providing the training to yes. other groups of people. And it comes back to that confidence thing. I think you mentioned it as well, that we, we generally find that women won't put themselves forward right. for something because they feel like uh, they don't quite have the skills to do the job. Totally. Whereas we meet a lot of men who perhaps aren't ready to, to kind of take on the role who just have the confidence to go ahead and do it. Yeah. What would you say to women in a similar position, yeah. um, maybe looking towards getting into kind of senior management to help mm. them kind of overcome, I guess it is a fear in some way, right? Or, yeah. Um, or to <clears throat> increase the level of confidence there. Yeah. I, th in fact, the um, quote in my email signature at the moment is by Amelia Earhart, and it's something to the effect of, the only way to do something is to do it. And I think that nothing could be more true of this scenario, right? Um, you have nothing to lose by trying. Um, and I, that's something that I have to remind myself of all the time. I have nothing to lose by applying for the position. I have nothing to lose by asking my boss if I can take the lead on some project. I have nothing to lose by trying to do something on my own or something new that I've not done before. And in fact, even if I'm not successful per se, I will have learned so much and I will know better for the next time. And that experience is uh, unparalleled. Uh, you know, you, you can't do anything if you're not even willing to take the first step. Um, the other thing is to just rally support. Um, I just have the most amazing group of friends who push me all the time. When I was asked to, asked to apply for the job that I currently have, um, I, I took a look at the job description and I sent it to a friend of mine and I was saying to him, I have no idea why they want me. I, why, why have they come to me and asked me to apply for this job? I, I'm not going to apply for it. Um, and he kind of taught me out of that. He said, you have to apply. What, what, what do you have to lose? And then again, during the application process, you know, they asked to put down my salary expectations. And talking to him again, I was saying, oh, again, like looking at this job description, I don't think that I'm the most qualified person. I'm, I don't have that much experience. And again, he was the one saying, ask for more, ask for more. And lo and behold, I got the job. And not only that, they offered it to me at my asking salary. There was no negotiation, nothing. And I still look back at that and thank, thank God I was talking to that friend that day and he made me just do it. Because right. I, I don't know if I would have done it myself. It's always a tricky yeah. one, right? Like how do you put a value on what you're doing as oh, well? totally. Especially if you're getting that feeling that you don't deserve <clears throat> to be in this role or you don't have the skills to be there, even though that's untrue. Absolutely. I'm um, listening on Audibles to a book about rethinking the way that organizations work. And um, they do a case study on one organization um, that allows every single employee to redefine their job description every year and set their own salaries. And I, that is fascinating to me. I have got to go and do more research on that. But when I was listening to it, I was thinking, I would find that so stressful at the beginning of every year to actually have to go and peg my own salary and decide right. what I'm worth. Um, but when you delve into that, I think that it, there is a fantastic fairness to that where you know, you're suddenly the boss of yourself and you're deciding what value you bring and how much you right. deserve, um, which is a fantastic experiment to do.
and of course in this book they're positing that this company is a lot more successful and they are coming up with really innovative new solutions you know and this is one of the reasons why so it reminds me of a documentary I saw on Channel 4 a few years ago where Pimlico, uh, Pimlico Plumbers um, essentially had their, they, they had a problem where they were saying that they had no more budget, they couldn't increase salaries of the staff. Yes. And uh, so it was up to the staff to figure out amongst themselves, if, if, someone, if everyone wanted a raise across the board, then they're going to need to figure it out because otherwise it's going to cost the business too much money. And so the CEO came out and said, I earn a million pounds a year. That's my that's my salary, and now everybody else, you can public, you can make your salary public if you like, and so some people did it, and some of the plumbers are on say ninety to one hundred thousand pounds a year, mm. but the people taking the calls and doing all the booking um, were maybe between say twenty and thirty thousand, and mm. they hadn't received pay rises, whereas the plumbers were earning more and more every year as the market <coughs> rate was changing, mm. and so what happened was, the people that were doing all the booking basically said to the plumbers, you know, if we weren't here organizing your schedules, you wouldn't be out doing as many jobs as you're doing. Yes. Um, and we have no way to get a pay rise. Yeah. And so some of the plumbers then ended up kind of giving up some of their salary yes. to pay back down into the lower pay bands. I've heard of a similar case study, a very similar thing, except that the, I guess, leadership went to everybody else and said, we can either get rid of our contractors who work for us so that all of you guys can keep your jobs and keep your salaries or can you help us find a way to keep these contractors here and the large majority of permanent staff were saying but we can't do without them we need them here otherwise we will suffer too and they did they all kind of negotiated around either reducing their salaries or or going on to part-time work or something so that contractors could keep their jobs and it's just fantastic examples of how you can rework these things and rethink about it. Absolutely. Um, and I think that sort of when we talk about the new face of work, over the next 20 years, that's going to become far more sort of prominent. I hope yeah. it will. Awesome. So I guess it's time now then. Can you share with us what you do now? <laughs> What's the role that you have? And, and kind of, sure. um, yeah, let's start with that. What's the role that you have and what does your day to day look like? Sure. So I'm not going to tell you my role title because it's really misleading. Okay. Um, but basically, I was asked to apply at a, um, a very big FMCG company last year. Um, and as I said, the, the job description, when I read it, I really it made no sense to me why they were asking me to apply it it sort of was referencing a lot of uh, wanting to have someone with a lot of experience in digital marketing and I have d digital marketing experience from all of the startups that I've been in but I, I'm by no means an expert um, and by no means amazing at it and I definitely don't have any train formal training in it um, and went for this interview thinking really don't know why they want me and sat down for the interview and my now boss at the time said to me I have to be really honest with you we have no idea what you're going to do um, we just know that we need startup um, well, people with startup experience who have that kind of a mindset who can come and help us infuse it into our work um, so I've jo joined one of their digital transformation teams and um, spent three months at the beginning of my contract with the company um, literally just listening and observing because I have never worked in a company that is bigger than 20 people and I was now working for a company of over a hundred thousand people and the operation that goes on was overwhelming um, and I really wanted to make sure that if we were going to be defining this role that had never been done at the company before that I was really well versed in terms of what was going on and I understood those things um, <clears throat> but sort of from about three months onwards my boss and I agreed that there were three core areas that I needed to be focusing on um, the one was around implementing 
some specific processes that a lot of startups use, like the growth hacking process, um, to help teams within the company achieve some pretty lofty goals. You know, so for example, doubling their um, organic traffic to some of their websites or something like that. And so that was just implementing a, a very rapid paced test and learn environment. Um, the second area that I was focusing on was around helping the business to democratize their data. Um, you know, at the time, just nobody even knew who owned the logins for Facebook Business Manager um, or YouTube or yeah. their Google AdWords account. Um, and not only that, but then where does that all go? So establishing a sort of centralized data lake and then actually creating the capability for different business units to plug into that data lake and and really mold and mesh the data based on whatever performance it was that they wanted to be able to see. And then the third part, and you'll understand now why this is my favorite part, has been focusing on culture within our specific team of 20 people and helping every single one of those individuals to work together more effectively and work a little bit more like a startup. So we've been borrowing a lot of agile principles specifically around um, helping everybody to commune over a common purpose, um, being really clear on what their role is and how they contribute to that purpose, and then implementing things like Scrum sort of method methodology with stand-ups and sprints and all of those exciting words that everybody loves to sort of throw around. Um, and, and that journey in and of itself has been fascinating. Um, it's been the toughest part of the job because it is change and no one <laughs> likes change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it has been the most rewarding when you start to see people who were the biggest cynics and hated doing it and begrudgingly were partaking to now being absolute champions and using the principles that we were talking about at the beginning of the year in every single aspect of their work you get to walk away feeling like you've done a good job and you've really helped people which is fantastic Ben would love this. So he is a design sprint facilitator. Uh -huh. That's part of the work he does. So yeah. this is right up his street. I think he would have so many questions coming to mind right now. Well, I should talk to him because I'm sure that he could give me a lot of pointers. <laughs> <laughs> so out of those three things, you said the kind of the last one is your, your favorite. Yeah. Just remind me, so the first one is around... Sort of implementing startup-like processes. So growth hacking and so on. Correct. The second... Data democratization. And, and then the third, so innovation, culture, culture and culture, innovation. Culture, yeah, okay. yeah. And innovation is actually quite a big part of it. Um, we I ran a workshop with my team a couple of months ago where we just brainstormed new capabilities that we might want to offer to consumers in the next year or so. And again, it's been so wonderful to see how inspired everyone is to suddenly realize that they can contribute to what consumers see on their shelves and in their apps, on their phones. Right. Um, suddenly everybody seems to have just that much more engagement with the work that they do. So I work at Google and uh, Larry Page, one of the kind of founding values, mm -hmm. if you like, was focus on the user and all else yeah. will follow. And it's that same thing. When people realize they can have a make a difference to the yeah. person that's going to use the product in whatever way, totally. it drives a lot. And funny you should say that. Uh, our North Star for our team is great consumer experience right. um, because really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if what you're offering them is something pretty the service you're offering is pretty standard um, or amazing. As long as the experience is really intuitive and helps them, people will use it. Um, and so it's been fantastic to kind of go back to those building blocks for everyone. And they use it, you know, every day when they're having to make decisions. Let that be your guiding light. And then the habit becomes the norm. But the, the kind of new thing becomes yes. the habit. Even. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So out of those three, the third is, it sounds like working on culture is your favorite. Which mm. was most surprising when you started? You know, you've been there a year now. What, what, what surprised you the most? Um, everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, I'm still pretty shocked at sort of how hard it is for big companies to to, to own their data you know um and it then it is no wonder why the likes of an amazon have just 
blown up and can do so much uh, because they just have access to all of this behavioral data that you know means that they can make decisions so much faster and they are usually decisions that resonate with customers um and it, it still kind of scares me because the job is huge to sort of get this data and then educate people within the company around the value of it and how to use it and how to get those insights from it um but also the culture to be honest with you the, there's a it's it's hierarchical um and to a large extent, people forget to question what they're told. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing is going, have you asked why? Like, do you know why you're doing this? Um, what do you really think about this? Because what is the saddest to see is some people don't think that their opinions count. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of work to remind everybody that they actually have a duty to make sure that their voices are heard when they disagree, because that's where the best work will come from. Absolutely, and to hold the organization to account, right? Because otherwise, totally. if the whole thing will fail if people don't yeah. question decisions that they maybe think aren't right. And it's good to hear about what the rationale was behind a decision so that you can better understand what it is you're being asked to 100%. do. 100%. And I, I would say that that's really managerial thinking. When, Of course, you want to understand the decision that's been made, but you want to understand how that decision was made mm -hmm. because that's what's going to really impact what you implement and how you think about things and how you make decisions, um, which is just as important, really. And so really, you, you're looking for everybody to be a leader, right? No matter what mm. your position is on a team, it doesn't matter whether you're managing people or not, yeah. you should lead in your own right. Totally, totally. And it's amazing how certain people have just really stepped up and you can see that they are ready to take on the challenge. They are those natural leaders who are there for it and then you've got other people who are by no means less capable but they just take a little bit more time to get comfortable with it and they're leading in their own way too you know and I have great respect for that because they're going away and they're thinking about what this means for them and how best they can overcome it um, which I think is just as valuable. Even when I think about Ben and I working together, we have two kind of different distinct styles of working though I would say we have similar say we have similar skill sets. So I very much uh, love to kind of brainstorm in the moment and think about, okay, what are the ideas that are coming out of here? Let's mm. discuss them and not get into too much detail right away. Let's get a load of ideas out across yes. the board and then we can go into more detail. And Ben would agree, um, but he definitely likes a bit more time to kind of take things in, yeah. right? It needs to soak first before yes. he can then come back with kind of his thoughts on what it meant. I'm very much like that. I yeah. need a little bit of time to go and process things and figure out what to do um, and a lot of people would say that in a startup that's not good because you have to move really quickly um, and I take a bit of time to come to terms with things but it's just a personal style isn't it right mm. and so you kind of mentioned before that you had experience in startups yeah. before so can you tell us a bit about your journey to get into the role that you're in now Absolutely. where you're working on these three things and kind of being disruptive, I guess, yeah. is a good way to describe it. Yeah, um, so I have had quite a few roles, and I, I guess um, I generally don't like to stay in one place for too long because then I just feel like I'm stagnating, and I like a steep learning curve. Right. Um, and so I started my very first job out of university. It was in a sales organization. Um, it was a big company in Cape Town in South Africa, international but they had an office in Cape Town um, and they really taught me the 101 of sales you know it was hardcore cold calling pitching um, closing and um, I stayed there for about nine months after which I felt oh I'm not gonna learn much more here and the promotion I, I'll get promoted to manager but then I'm still just doing exactly what I'm doing right now but I'm responsible for three other people and don't know if I want this and there was a woman at that company who, who whose boyfriend had started his own company and they were starting to get really successful and they needed someone to come in and take sales over from the founders and um, so I moved over to them and I really did just start the sales department from scratch there figuring out what the sort of the quickest path to close was so that we could you know, just do it on a repeatable, replicable 
the scale. What was the product? Um, the product was text messaging, SMS, okay. you know. Uh, so it was really standard and actually quite transactional. Um, and uh, we were then bought out by one of the biggest companies in South Africa. And I worked very closely with um, the leadership team to help them manage that merging of teams. Um, it was across two different cities in South Africa. And um, I was really just there helping them to take the learnings from our sales team, which was a lot smaller, but really successful, um, and sort of transfer that knowledge into their much more established sales team. And then I was also taking the new processes that we would have to adopt and learn how to use. Um, so that our customers would have a much more seamless experience. Um, and I so I'd been there for about three years, which was the longest time, but I kind of counted as, I was at two companies then, because right. there was the startup and then there was the company that bought the startup. Um, and at that time, I have a British passport and I'd always threatened to move to London at some point. And I just, my lease was up on my current place in Cape Town and I was having brunch with my boss at the time and I tongue in cheek said, God, you know, I could sign a lease for a place in Cape Town or I could sign a lease for a place in London. And he kind of went, go for it, do it, you have to go. Yeah. Um, and so I came to London for a week, uh, did some interviews with some telecommunications companies doing the exact same thing that my current existing company had done, got a job offer and moved over within a month. Um, started at that company and I quit within five weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> And you'd only just moved. i just moved. And honestly, I just sat there thinking, I have not moved 10,000 kilometers to do the same thing right. that I was doing. Um, it was an entirely instinctual decision. You know, the, the salary was good, the job I could do, but I just sat there going, I don't want to do this. And there's just something there that isn't clicking. Right. Um, and so I went back to my old um, CEO of the company in South Africa and I just sort of said you you know you're looking to expand into Europe I'm here why don't you let me go and figure out how you can go and do that so I consulted for them for about sort of nine months or so and then decided I, I wanted to work back in a team again and sort of face the big what big wide world of London. Um, and so I moved to a uh, recruitment tech startup called Beamery um, and very much the same thing. I was taking over sales from the founders. Right. Um, and again, just figuring out what that repeatable scale was um, or that repeatable process was, uh, but just a whole new industry, whole new piece of tech. So I loved learning all about the recruitment industry, its people, understanding their behavior. Um, and you were selling software as a service? Correct, right. yes, yeah. And um, I was there for about nine months, did not love the founders, if I'm honest, and found them very, very difficult to work with. And um, it was at a Christmas party, whatever year that was, um, that I was chatting to somebody who I had met on my very, very first day that I lived in London, um, moving over from South Africa. He had started a company and he kind of he said, how's your job going? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm not the happiest. I don't love the founders. They're quite difficult people. And he said, well, we kind of need someone like you. Should we chat? And so I moved over to their company in the new year. And um, there I took on a sales and a marketing role, but it was now in a B2C environment as opposed to business to business. And loved absolutely every second of it. Um, I had such respect for the two founders of that company, they're called Lively, um, who made me feel like that company was my own. Um, I felt like my own boss. I had absolute carte blanche to, you know, define my own routine, work from wherever I wanted to work from. Um, there was plenty to do, plenty to sink my teeth into, and I just relished every second of it. Um, there were some really hard moments where I, I remember sitting in the back of an Uber with the CEO crying because I was saying, I can't do this hard thing. And he was going, yes, you can. I, you're going to be fine. It'll be OK. And three days later, I'd done the hard thing. Right. <laughs> and I felt great about it. And it, it just needed so, a nudge. Exactly. I, I think sometimes you need to know that someone believes in you. Um, 
And um, so that company secured their Series A um, at the beginning of last year. And um, I think it was just through conversations with myself and the CEO that we realized that the best, I had given the best that I already could. And it was now time for somebody with a little bit more executive experience to come in and um, take the company to where it needed to go. And so it was at that point then that um, the FMCG company that I'm currently at contacted me. And um, so I took three months of sort of gardening leave over summer last year to just regroup and collect myself. And then I started there. That's really interesting. So the job you're in now, they found you. Yes, they did. How did that happen? Um, It was through LinkedIn. I had um, just put on my profile that I was open to offers. In fact, it always has been because I always want to know what else is out there for me. Um, But in all honesty, there have been very few jobs that I have applied for cold. You know, Um, it's always come from, uh, you know, somebody that I knew through networking or a friend of a friend. Um, and yeah, the recruiters just got in touch with me and they sort of said, you have to apply for this role, you know, so I did. Um, and there Do you I agree? I, I feel like, you know, as the, as we move on, the world is changing, there's more technology everywhere. It does feel to me that the more you can network, um, even from a young age, while you're yeah. in the latest stages of high school, even. Yeah. The more you can network, the more that you're going to benefit from that as yes. you get older. You know, I, that person that you met just as you moved to London ended totally. up being a good connection months later. Yeah, he, he literally did sort of change my life. You know, right. he, he, he really has um, changed the trajectory of my life. Um, networking is essential. But I think one of the things that I really battled with, especially when I moved to, to London, is finding the right networks. You know, um, I, I love engaging with people, I love socializing, I enjoy being around people, but by that same token, it is quite draining. Um, and so I'm very careful about who I spend my time with, what events I go to, but there was a big learning curve again, moving to London with that, because honestly, when you don't know anyone, you only have access to some pretty basic networking opportunities where, I'm sorry to say, it's, it's literally just, you know, the. This is the plumber in the neighborhood who's looking to get in touch with more homes who might need his services. Right. When you're wanting to get into big businesses and really talk to some very important people. Um, so it's something that just takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it can be quite draining yeah. <laughs> at times. But um, I think the older I've got, the more I've been able to recognize someone who will be really good to just maintain a connection with and stay in contact with. Um, and it doesn't have to be that intense, you know, you can just drop them a line every now and then and find out how they are. And um, by that same token, people will start coming to you too. Right. I'm amazed now by how many people are coming to me and wanting my help. And I'm going, me? Why me? I haven't done anything. Um, but it's, it's that imposter syndrome. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> How do, um, what's your secret then? What would be, if you could just give people one tip around mm, building a good network or finding the right networking events, yeah. what would it be? Um, I think, gosh, what would it be? You've really got to, I think, know what help it is that you want. What you need to know what it is that you're looking for. Um, you never want to go with someone and just ask them for, you know, with a vague request for help. You want to be really specific about what it is that you need from them. Um, and I've always been pleasantly surprised by how much people will want to help you when you are specific about what it is that you're asking from them. By nature, I think that most people are very good and they will want to help you. Um, but that will also help you identify which events to go to, um, what company events to attend and who to speak to whilst you're at those events. It's really, really cool. I think um, 
networking it, it can come across as this big scary thing and yeah i don't think anyone really loves it at the end of an event perhaps that you've been to and there's networking time there's at least an awkward 10 minutes where yeah. you, you know you've got to figure out right who are you going to go and talk to i think what you said is a great tip know yeah. what you want to ask for right and if you're at an event with multiple people yeah. think about who's going to be there that you could possibly go up to even yeah. if it's not someone specific kind of maybe the roles they're in or the companies yeah. they work for I think the other part of it is, and especially again for women, um, it comes across as slightly schmoozy. Mm. Um, and it, nobody likes to come across as inauthentic either. But I, but I think that that's, you have to find the way of doing it authentically. Um, maybe for you, it's going onto an online forum and just building relationships with people who are commenting there. Um, it, it might be going to larger conferences and just talking to the person sitting next to you. But if you can find the way to do it that is authentic and real to you, you will ultimately meet those right people. But don't do anything that doesn't feel like it fits for you. Right. Because <laughs> it'll that, come yeah. across, yeah. Make it authentic yeah. to you. Really, yeah. really, really like that. Yeah, and I think work to your strengths and work to your weaknesses. As I said, if you hate going to those events, don't. Because people will know. Right. But if you can find forums where, you know, whatever it is that you're interested in is being discussed, that's a potentially great way to meet people. Yeah. Um, you've even got, um, what is it, Bumble for Business now. Is oh, really? Doing? I, to be fair, I don't know a lot about it, but I yeah. believe they are sort of matching mm. sort of people with a lot of potential to business owners and mentors who can help them which is a fantastic model for Yeah, really people. clever idea. It is. Yeah. Great idea for a business as well. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And no no surprise Bumble is um, was founded by a woman. So you can tell you can see how it's probably influenced by yeah. a lot of her understanding around what women want and how they want to engage. And in fact, I'm working with a woman in blockchain group at the moment to host a hackathon and of course we're looking to have it attended by a majority women right. and um, we've really been looking at how hackathons have been run in the past and how they just haven't been friendly to women one of the things is how do you create your team you know um, and for a lot of women and I think for a lot of men it's super overwhelming to have to just go to someone and say hi I'm Caitlin this is my background I'm looking for someone who can code please help me please come yeah. and join my team so we were saying, well, how do we get around that? How do we help people to identify one another and understand what they need to build their own team? Um, so there's a lot there to it. When I think when you really start to look at people and understand what their own challenges are, you can actually design something for them that really works, which goes back to user experience. Right, yeah, and <laughs> little things can make a big difference to people, right? Just small totally. changes can make a huge totally. difference. Totally, yeah. So rather than say, what will you do next? Yeah. I'm really interested to know if you could do anything, mm -hmm. and not, not just job-wise, if you could yeah. just do anything, yeah. what would you do and why? Um, it's, it's funny that you ask because it's actually a really exciting time for me at the moment where I am kind of evaluating some opportunities that I have and that again will allow me to level up and do something new and exciting. Um, but ultimately, wherever I go and whatever job I'm doing, um, it, I hope that it is in working with and inspiring other people. I don't think that I am particularly special. I don't think that I have any sort of essential skills that allow me to deliver something better, but I do know how to tap into the skills and capabilities of other people to deliver things that are absolutely amazing. Um, and so there is leadership in my future, which is purely around getting a group of people together and being awesome. Um, and that just makes me so happy, you know. So in any way that I can figure out how to inspire people, I will continue to pursue. It sounds like there's a startup idea in there. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think, I've always said that once I left my current business, it would be to go and start my own thing. And so I'm exploring the opportunities to be able to do that at the moment. Excellent. Oh, well, we'll all be looking on with interest for sure. Yes, well, please do keep in touch and remind me that I'm not alone. <laughs> for sure. Is there anything else that you want to add today? Anything, if you could, maybe there's one thing that you feel that you really want to share with everybody before you leave them? What? I think it would be to be really careful about what it is you choose to believe that others say about yourself. You know, um, everybody has an opinion about who you are and where you are could be best suited in a job role um and but i think you have to be careful about who you whose advice you ask for um and at the very same time don't be scared to disregard people's advice if it doesn't sound right to you um there are some people who i have spoken to who at one point in my sort of life were in extremely inspiring amazing people who I looked up to and I really admired and who, whose advice I sought all the time who you know at some point something turned and they told me something about where they thought I should be focusing and I just sat there and thought I'm not going to take that piece of advice it doesn't sit well with me but knowing yourself well enough to be able to do that is really important and I think just be careful about who you choose to believe when you're asking for advice about yourself. Ultimately, you're the only person who knows yourself well enough to make those decisions. I think that's an amazingly profound note to end on. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, well, thank really you for having me. It. I've loved this. Hi, I've been here. Thanks for listening so far. So it sounded like the end then, but actually Dean and Caitlin met up back in 2019. Uh, when such a thing was possible. And since then, Caitlin's been busy with some new ventures. And what we wanted to do was give you a little update. So keep listening for an update from Caitlin about what she's up to now. Enjoy. So I left Unilever at the end of 2019 to start my own business, Mission Innovation. I'm hosting a podcast also called Mission Innovation, and I'm writing a book on how enterprises can manage their external relationships to improve their ability to innovate. Wow, I just said innovate a lot. <laughs> but we develop bespoke workshops with leadership teams to help them design a strategy to do this. And we've got some exciting releases coming, including opening a community for corporate innovators to share their experiences and learn from one another on a digital platform. I think this is going to become such a powerful way for us to build up our knowledge. I'm really enjoying being the master of my own destiny. There's no doubt about it that working for yourself comes with its challenges, but I feel like I'm at the right point in my life to be taking these on. I'm learning a lot, not just about starting a business, but also about myself. It's an incredible journey and I'm so grateful to be on it. I think the COVID-19 lockdown has shown me how unnecessary it is to be chained to a desk in a specific location. My partner and I are making plans to become global citizens so that we can travel and work from anywhere in the world come 2021. Join us next time where I'll be speaking to Sam Peck.